Almighty, awesome and amazing God, praise your holy name. Thank you for the promise that you are with us wherever we go. We claim their presence right now that you are in this place, reigning above it all, but here in this place. Welcome, Lord. May we give honor and glory to you by how we respond in this service. And I ask for two things this morning. Number one, Lord, that there would not be one person in this place who would not realize that they're not here by accident or by chance, but they're here by divine appointment, that you wanted them here in this place at this time to do something amazing and awesome in their life. And may they be ready for that. And then, Lord, I also pray for this speaker, that you would empty him of self and fill him with your Holy Spirit so that what is, comes out of his mouth is pleasing to you. And so, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in thy sight. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Mars Hill Community Church. My name is Jim Burt, and I lead the vintage ministry here at Mars Hill. I also lead the divorce care ministry. I am also a resident bus driver here, and um, I do pretty much anything else that I'm able to do that is needed, just like a lot of you. The vintage ministry is such a blessing to Denise and I and to everyone who chooses to be a part of it. Though there are those who could be a part of vintage who are not because they don't feel old enough to be in vintage. Um, I want you to know that there is not one person in vintage that feels old enough to be in vintage. Take me, for instance. Um, when I look in the mirror, you might think that I see something like this, a guy that probably is old enough to be in vintage. But no, that's not what I see when I look in the mirror. I see this young whippersnapper, com complete with cap and gown, with his whole life before him. And so I'm not feeling old enough to be in vintage. And um, we're in vintage, all of us who are, because it's a great ministry and because it has been immeasurably helpful to us in our life. Some of you have asked how the training is going for our new rescue dog I told you about last time named Milo. He is doing amazingly well in his training. He is learning so much. Um, we think he's really pretty smart. In fact, um, we have gotten to the point in his training where uh, we are teaching him, as you can see, how to drive a car. Now, he's doing really well with that, although he is struggling with parallel parking. But aren't we all? Yeah. Now, when he gets um, automobile driving down, I'm going to teach him how to drive a school bus. Now, you're laughing, but it's a great job for the right dog, and um, he may just well be the right dog for that job. Speaking of school bus driving, um, some of you were very interested last time when I talked about how we maintain order and discipline on the bus, especially in light of the fact that there are 60-some kids and we have our back turned to them the entire time we're driving. And so I told you about one method we use um, from time to time, which is to pull the bus over to the side of the road and tell the kids we're not leaving until they begin to behave. Now, that doesn't work all the time. It has very mixed results. In fact, some of the buses um, from last year are still out on the side of the road. The kids have not yet um, learned how to behave. And so we're starting a new year. I don't know how that's all going to work out. But um, we, I have a method that I use that's better than pulling over to the side of the road. And um, I, it works every time that I've used it. And uh, you, when you hear about this, you're going to think less of me. I know it. And you're going to say, how can you call yourself a Christian and do that to our obedient, compliant, loving little children? 
Well, it, it works, so that's why I use it. But I want to I wanna show you a picture. Now, you might want to cover your kids' eyes when I show this picture. It, it could be traumatic, okay? And it's going to explain to you what I do. It's seat number one. I told you it was bad, didn't I? Seat number one on the school bus is the worst possible thing that can happen to somebody that's driving in a school or riding in a school bus. It's so close to the driver. In fact, I'm sitting right over here, and you can, I can see everything these kids are doing. Nobody on a school bus wants the bus driver seeing everything that they can do. So usually, I just threaten them with seat number one, and it works. But, you know, on the, some instances, it doesn't work. And let's say there's a little boy named Jeffrey on my school bus. And I happen to see in my student mirror, Jeffrey doesn't know this, but I see that he threw something out the window. Now, throwing something out the window on a school bus is an immediate seat number one infraction. You're going to be in seat number one if you do that, and there's probably other consequences as well. So I see Jeffrey do this. I pull the bus over to the side of the road, and I say, okay, Jeffrey, you come up into seat number one. Jeffrey says, why? What did I do? I don't want to be in seat number one. I said, Jeffrey, you sit in seat number one, and we both know what you did. But until you tell me what you did, I'm going to keep you in seat number one, even if that means to the end of this school year or if it means to the end of your senior year in high school. You're going to sit there until you tell me what you did. But Mr. Jim, I didn't do anything, so how can I tell you about something I didn't do? And I said, okay, well, then you're just going to sit there. So I um, pull the bus onto the road. I'm hearing some weeping from seat number one. And about 30 seconds into the drive, I hear Jeffrey's voice, Mr. Jim, did I maybe throw something out the window? <laughs> Some of you are laughing. Um, you've got a Jeffrey in your house, don't you? And I say, Shazam! I think you're on to something, Jeffrey. And that traumatic experience of sitting in seat number one often solves that problem for the rest of their school bus career. Now, this morning, the title of my message is How God Solves Your Problems. When I first started met, uh, working on this message, my title was different. It was how God solves mankind's problems. I changed it because I know that for me, when I hear a word so general as mankind, that I don't really take it personally and I don't take it as seriously as I should. And this morning, I want you to take what we're saying personally and seriously, that there is a God who can solve your problems problems. And you need to know how he can do that. And we're going to learn that this morning. Um, just in case you think that you having the problems that you have, that there's something desperately wrong with you or even uncommonly wrong with you. But remember Jesus said these words in John chapter 6. He's 16. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Would you read those underlined words with me? In this world you will have trouble. So God knows that we will have trouble. We obviously know that we have trouble. Um, but does God even care about our troubles? Well, yes, he does. <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, we read these words, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Some of the other translations have it this way, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. God, in fact, cares for you more than you care for yourself. He knows you, he created you, he loves you. So let's agree this morning about some things. Let's agree, first of all, we all have problems. Second, let's all agree that God cares about our problems. And third, let's agree that if God is who the Bible says that he is, and I submit to you this morning he is, 
He can solve our problems. So it's, we have all believe, I hope, that God can solve our problems. What I want to show you this morning is this. How God solves your problems. Because there is a way that he does it. It's illustrated for us in a passage of scripture. And I'm going to show you that passage of scripture. And we're going to see from it how he solves not just your biggest problem, but all of your problems. Okay, the passage of scripture that we're going to use this morning is Galatians chapter 4 and verses 4 and 5. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. In this passage, we see how God solved the biggest problem that any person has ever had. It's a problem that, if it is not solved, will become an eternal problem. Not just today or tomorrow, but forever and ever it will be a problem. It is the problem of sin and the death sentence that is attached to it. We all have the problem of sin. Among a host of other passages that tell us that, we have Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, which says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's not a newsflash to most people. Um, we know we fall short. In fact, we don't even want to think about how far short we fall. We're not just not perfect. We are almost entirely imperfect. Then, the consequences of that sin is made very clear in Scripture. The wages of sin is death. And then in Ezekiel 18 and verse 20, it says it this way. The soul that sins, it shall die. So we are talking about an eternal problem. And it's the problem of literally losing your soul for eternity. Mark 8, 36, which we'll study in a few weeks here at Mars Hill, says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's a question you ought to ask yourself. <laughs> what will it profit me if I gain the whole world and lose my own soul? Now, some of you have asked that question, like I did as a young teenager, and I decided to take God's solution <laughs> for my sin and the resulting death, and to save my soul instead of losing my soul. Some of you have not yet made that decision, but today you can make it right here in this place because God is here and you are here and everything God wants to do in your life is available to you today. Now, some of you might be thinking, you know, Jim, I could see how you think that you know, this sin and death thing is, is a big deal because you're a preacher and you're preaching about sin and death. So, yeah, you take it really seriously. But I, I know it's kind of a problem, but, you know, it's, I have other big problems in my life that seem to make that one seem like small stuff. Well, may I suggest to you today that if you are a Christian, and by that I mean you have received Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, Savior from sin and death. And yet, you feel like that's not that big an issue. You have not really been convinced that, that um, there is, uh, you're not deeply and overwhelmingly convinced that sin and its destructiveness and the resulting death it brings uh, if you're not convinced of that, you're also not overwhelmed and convinced that God has saved you and delivered you, and that is the singular most important thing in your life. If you don't wake up every morning and think, well, thank God for life, but also thank God he has delivered me from sin and death, and he has delivered me to life, you're probably struggling in your spiritual growth and you're probably a little stagnant and you're probably just kind of hanging out there a little bit 
And you need to be overwhelmingly convinced of what God has done for you to deliver you from this greatest problem that you have ever faced. Now, as you listen today and you see what God has done, let what God has done to deliver you from sin and death capture your mind and your heart and your soul and your spirit so that the wonder of what God has done in saving you never leaves center stage in your thinking and in your life. Now, Galatians 4, 4 and 5 tells us how God solved that biggest problem, if you will accept his solution. But it also gives us a vision of how God solves all of our other problems. And you have many, many other problems that God wants to solve. Um, the pattern that God will use is found, again, in Galatians 4, 4 and 5. So, let me just read it to you again. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. So let's break it down to a pattern. First of all, God solves your problems at just the right time. The scripture there said, but when the time had fully come. Second, God solves your problems by his own power. The scripture says, God sent his son. Thirdly, um, God solves your problems in miraculous ways. The scripture says, born of a woman. Fourth, God solves your problems in the right way. But under the law, born under the law to redeem those under the law. And then fifth, God solves your problems completely that we might receive the full rights of sons. So there's the pattern. So what, in addition to the biggest problem that you have, which is sin and death, what other problems do you have in your life? And I did something last time that I'm going to repeat in part this morning, the last time I preached, and it was to give you a list of problems that people in this congregation have. And some of us have multiple problems. And I am giving you this list because I don't want you to just gloss over the word problem or trouble and say, well, that's just kind of a general thing he's talking about. No, you have specific problems. You have specific troubles. And God wants to solve those. And he's given us a pattern for how he solves them. So I want you to be so um, clearly aware of what the problems are God wants to solve in your life. Maybe your problem is your health or the health of someone that you love. It is that health has changed your life or it's changed the life of the person that you love or care for, and it's, it, it's made life really hard. Maybe your problem is your job situation. Your boss is driving you crazy. There may be expectations of you which you just cannot meet and demands that are way above what should be happening, and yet you need the job. You just can't walk away from it, but you just don't know what to do. Or maybe you don't have a job and need one, or you need a better job than the one that you have. Perhaps your children, your little children, your teenage children, or your adult children uh, children can bring us some of the greatest joys that we will ever have in life, and they can bring us some of the greatest pains that we could ever experience as well. Your parents may be your problem. They have grown old to the point that they cannot take care of themselves the way they have throughout their life, and you're taking care of their finances, you're taking care of their health, you're taking care of their home, and it's just overwhelming for you. And it's something you never dreamed that you would have to face. Perhaps your marriage, it's in trouble, or at best, it's troubling. And it is headed in the wrong direction, and you know it, and you don't know what to do. Perhaps it's your finances. You're in debt. You are overwhelmed by um, what you, what's going out and what little seems to be coming in. 
and you just can't meet all of those needs, and it's a constant pressure on you. Perhaps your loneliness, someone um, that you loved or someone you cared about deeply, you have a broken relationship with them, or maybe someone has moved or someone has died, and you are lonely, and you don't know what to do about it. Perhaps you have wonderful plans for the future, dreams, goals, and they're just not working out. They are failing miserably. And everything that you wanted and everything you thought was ahead for you in life has crumbled beneath your feet. Perhaps your family or friends have turned on you. We have some in this congregation this morning who have had people just turn on them. Sometimes they don't even know why it's happened. A friend stops talking to you. A family member stops having anything to do with you and creating a deep hurt within your heart. You might have a destructive habit or an addition, uh, addiction, which is playing havoc with your life, and it's affecting those who love you and live, near, live in your life, and it's not only destroying you, it's destroying them as well. Perhaps your life pressures. It just seems like there's so much stress, so much is expected of you, so much is on you, and you are tired all the time, and you just don't know what to do, and it's, it's eating you alive. Or perhaps you have deep grief or depression, and someone has left your life. Someone has died, and you just have this grief, this depression, and it, it won't go away. Then every once in a while, you start seeing a little bit of light, and then it comes back it's twice as bad as it was and overwhelms you. So what is your problem this morning? Is it one of these? If it's not, one of these will be coming after you very soon, maybe before the end of this service. Or maybe you've got another one that wasn't on this list. Add it to your list and know that God can and wants to solve your problems that you are facing. Now, let's go into each of these five ways that God solved your biggest problem and then how he can solve these other problems that we've just talked about. Number one, God solves your problems at just the right time. The scripture says, but when the time had fully come, I was talking to one of um, the members of Vintage before the first service, and she said, What's your, what are you preaching on this morning? And I said, uh, I'm preaching on how God solves your problems. And she said, you are going to tell them that he solves them in his own time, right? <laughs> she had not seen my notes or anything, but she's been through enough that she has come to grips with the fact that it's God's timing which is most important. Some of the other ways that other translations express um, when the time had fully come, but when the set time came, God has set times, but when the fullness of time was come, another version says, but when the right time came. So when is the right time? It is God's time. The time God chooses to do what he is going to do. God is never early. He is never late. He's always at just the right time because that's how God works, and that's how God is in his person. We may not always see it that way. In fact, um, the way we think is, God, solve my problems now, or if not now, yesterday, please. Um, when we are hurting, that particular thought just seems to overwhelm us. And so when we are in pain, physical pain or emotional pain or mental pain, we often become singularly self-absorbed. And By the way, those three words are not good words for you, singularly self-absorbed. It's difficult to think clearly, to be patient, or to trust in a different plan other than please take the pain and the darkness away 
and please take it away, Lord, now. God sees things so differently than we do. God sees things perfectly. He is eternal, and as an eternal God, he exists outside of time, so he can look at the whole picture at once. And he is able to choose not just a good time, not just your time, but he is able to choose the very best time. Now, in the timing of sending his son to meet the greatest need that we have, the problem of sin and death, it certainly was that way. From the time that Adam and Eve first sinned and God gave the first promise back in Genesis 3 that he would send a Savior to bring forgiveness for sin and to give people life out of the clutches of death, the world had waited for that Savior for a long, long time. Nearly every Old Testament prophet said, he is coming, he is coming, and yet he did not come. God was waiting for the exact right moment. Much has been written from a historical perspective about why the time that Jesus actually came was the very best time, the perfect time, the fullness of time. So let me give you some of the reasons that Christian historians have suggested made the time at the beginning of the uh, you know, zero, basically, A.D. as the um, best time. There was, at that time, what's called the Pax Romana, or the Peace of Rome. The world, for one of its first times, it wasn't perfect, but there was peace. Rome ruled with an iron fist. And so when the gospel message spread, they didn't have to worry about, well, what country's at war with another country? There was a general peace that made spreading the gospel um, much easier. The Roman system of roads also helped. Some of the Roman roads still exist today. They were that well built. And really, this was the first uh, worldwide road system. And of course, that made the preaching of the gospel and the missionary efforts of the apostles much more possible. The, from the time that um, Alexander the Great took over the world, he dreamed of a universal language that everyone would understand. And he chose what's called Koine Greek. And Koine Greek did spread throughout the world. It wasn't known by everyone, but it was known by most people. And that helped also in the preaching of the gospel. All the apostles, disciples, knew Koine Greek. And they could preach to people in that language and people could understand it. There was a general sense of hopelessness in the world at the time. The philosophies and the philosophers had failed and everybody admitted it. And there was a general sense of hopelessness because of that. There was deep discontent among the Jews which is why they responded so readily to John the Baptist's message. John the Baptist didn't bring an easy message. He told people they were sinners, that they needed to repent. He told the leaders that they were snakes, venomous snakes. And yet, those people responded to his message, and the reason they did was that there was a discontent spiritually. They knew something was wrong, and they were ready for God's message. The world had become also very morally corrupt. Slavery was rampant. There were more slaves than free people in the world at that time, at least the Roman world. The plays and the dramas were very corrupt. The amphitheater, um, the people loved to see the sight of blood. It was a fascination for them. And that turned bitterly bad for Christians who... Um, lost their lives um, to animals and to gladiators um, in the arenas. The Mediterranean Sea, cleared of pirates by Pompeii and guarded by the other seizures, made travel by sea much safer. Some places, traveling by sea is much quicker, down to Egypt and the African countries and up north. And the seas were cleared of pirates who had made um, sailing and um, being on the sea as dangerous as it could possibly be. But now, at the time that the gospel message needed to go out, the seas were clear of pirates. Cities had become cosmopolitan centers that people would journey to so that missionaries could reach large numbers of people. 
Jews had been spread around the world through what we call the diaspora as a result of the Roman conquest and persecution of Judea. And so synagogues and monotheism were everywhere. Uh, monotheism is a unique idea in the world, but the Jews took it before the Christians took it, and so the world was ready. Rome had granted a freedom of religion because it had no one religion it wanted to promote, and it was safe to give room and space for all gods. So they stopped persecuting um, um, religions for a time. There were times and some Caesars that wanted to be worshipped and wanted um, themselves to be the religion, but for the most part, there was a freedom of religion that made it possible for people to preach a new message, the message of Christianity. Now, that's a pretty compelling case right there for the actual time of Christ's birth being exactly the right time. And yet, even if we couldn't see all of what I just showed you, we would know that God's timing is perfect because God is perfect. Just think of all those people, though, that waited for so many years for the time of Christ's birth. Um, David, in the Psalms, experienced a little bit of that. And he says something that we need to grasp. He was, at the time that he wrote this passage I'm about to show you, um, experiencing and facing multiple problems. His enemies were harassing him. He was in constant danger for his life, and his future looked really hopeless. He needed God to come to his rescue, and he needed God to come to his rescue now, and yet God was not doing that just yet. So this is what David said, but I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hands. Would you repeat the underlined with me? My times are in your hands. Um, please know that our times, that your times are in God's hands. God is too loving to be unkind and too wise to make mistakes in his timing. His timing will be perfect. May I just say one more thing here. Would it be all right with you if in God's timing... He did not solve your problem until you got to heaven. That you went through your whole life in pain, perhaps darkness, with the Savior's help, but it didn't go away. It wasn't solved until you got to heaven. You know, sometimes God has that as his plan. We often see that and talk about that when um, someone is facing health problems and is near to death. We pray, like we did for Mary Wright, pray that she'd be better, that she'd be okay. Mary wasn't praying that way, by the way. <laughs> she was kind of anxious to go to heaven, although she wanted to serve God until the very last breath that she took. But you know, when Mary went to heaven, the cancer was gone. God answered our prayers. Um, the potential pain, the uh, being immobile, all of that, was past. It was gone. Because God brings the ultimate healing sometimes. And it's okay if you wait until heaven. Every person in heaven would say to you today, it's okay if God doesn't solve your problem in this world. If he waits until you come to heaven, you'll have all eternity to enjoy and love the, the problem solving that God will do in your life. The second thing we want to look at today is that God solves your problems by his own power. The text says God sent his son. This is not, by the way, God helps those who help themselves. What God wants to do to solve your problems is God-centered. It's not man-centered with a little sprinkling of God on the side. It is totally God-centered with only a response from us possible. So let me put it this way. Not God helps those who help themselves, but God helps everyone who will rely upon his power, allowing him to help them, and who will participate in the solution that God by his power is bringing about. 
Now, a frustrated theologian by the name of Jim Burke came up with that, and it's helped me through, through my life. God's power is always his own prerogative. This, of course, doesn't mean you do nothing, sit by idly waiting for God to do something. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Some positive thinking Christians stop after I can do everything. That's not what the verse says. It says, I can do everything through Christ, him who gives me strength. Just like God sent his son, Christ gives you strength. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. At the time that Jesus was born, as well as before that time, there were those who were tired of waiting. The prophets had said, he is coming, he is coming. Everything was ready as far as they were concerned because as far as they were concerned, now is always the best time if yesterday isn't available. Um, but, uh, and some of those people, in, because they were frustrated, um, they, um, some of them chose to be a Messiah themselves, a false one. Or they said, we found the Messiah, a false one. That didn't help anything. When you try to do God's work it, for God, it, it doesn't work. Let God do his own work. You participate with him in that work, and then things work the way they're supposed to. And so we'll say it this way. It is not that God cannot do it in time or in power. It's just that now is not the right time, and we need to patiently wait for his solution and to be open to anything that he wants us to do and to learn as we wait for him. So God's power is his own prerogative. Thirdly, this morning, God solves your problems in miraculous ways. The text says, born of a woman. Now, what is a miracle? The simplest way that I can explain it is that when God created the world, he set it in motion so that things happen in an orderly way. Now, sin has corrupted that order to a certain extent, but things still progress in an order. When God intervenes in that order and brings about something different, that is a miracle. It's an intervention by God into the natural order to bring about what he wants. And so, every answer to prayer is a miracle by that definition. It is God intervening in the natural order and instead bring about his desire in response to our prayer. That means that if nature would normally proceed in a certain way, God can intervene and bring out something different. In the seas, in the weather, it doesn't matter. God can intervene. If sickness would normally proceed in a certain way, God can intervene and change that and bring healing. If, if people would normally react in certain ways to you or to the circumstances around you, God can intervene and change that. If you would react normally in a certain way to people or to circumstances, if it's not the best way, God can intervene and change that. He changes you when he desires to if a job offer would, certain, would come in a, a certain way, God can intervene and change that so that you get the job or you get it better than you thought or not get it. God can intervene and bring about what he wants. And so I believe that miracles are far more prevalent than people could ever even imagine. I think God is constantly intervening. We don't see most of it, but he is at work. Um, in our text, it says that um, made of a woman or born of a woman. I th some of the versions say made of a woman. And you, some of you say, well, that doesn't sound like much of a miracle to me. Um, don't we all say that? Born from his mother? Well, um, the Jews and the Greeks didn't very often say that. 
When they talked about a birth, they talked about the father, or they talked about the family lineage that went through the father. And so to say born of a woman, they knew and they could see that babies were born of a woman, but they just didn't use that terminology. And so when the writer of Galatians used born of a woman, he was saying something quite unusual and actually miraculous. That this baby, and we know this from other parts of the scripture, this baby that was born of a woman was born miraculously, what we call the virgin birth. There was no involvement in the man, by the man, in giving his seed or his sperm. Um, it was God the Holy Spirit who implanted in Mary the seed of Jesus. So it was godly DNA, <laughs> it was God's seed, but it combined with Mary's egg so that this one that was born was the God-man, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus. And so as one who is fully man, he could die for and take the penalty for other people, other of, of mankind. Now, he had to be a perfect man because otherwise he would have to die for his own sins. That's where the virgin birth comes in. The, the uh, sin is passed down through the seed or the sperm of the man. The man was not involved in the virgin birth at all. And so Jesus was born with no sin and no sin nature so he could die for others. But the fact that he was born the God-man was even more important because as God, he would be infinite. And so he could die for an infinite number of people and an infinite number of sins. Just think of all the sins that have been committed and all the sins that will be committed until Jesus comes. It's a staggering amount. God is infinite. He could die for every one of them. There's not a limit to him at all. And so this is not just a cute little Christmas story about the virgin birth. This was a total necessity, and it had to be miraculous. And that's how God will often solve your problems, with the miraculous. Do you need a healing? God is able. Do you need money? God is able. Do you need um, a relationship restored and healed? God is able. And he's able through the miraculous. He can intervene in the normal course of events and do as he pleases. Some of you would think it's impossible that this relationship could ever be restored or it's impossible that that person would ever get saved or, you know, you could say the impossible word as often as you want, but nothing is impossible with God. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. He is able, he is capable, and he can do it in your life. Okay, let's move on to now our fourth this morning, God solves your problems in the right way. Born under the law to redeem those under the law. Now, what do I mean by God solves your problems in the right way? God doesn't cut corners. And he doesn't take the easy way out um, to solve your problems. He doesn't have to lie or help you get away with a lie. That's not the miracle God wants to do. He doesn't take people out because they are um, a thorn in your flesh. He doesn't help you get away with cheating because that's the only way out of your troubles to cheat. So God's going to help you get away with cheating. He doesn't do it. He doesn't have to help you win the lottery to provide you with money. I know that's a disappointment to some of you. Some of you heard it. Somebody won the lottery and you're going home to check your pick tickets. Chances are um, very high that no one in this congregation won the lottery. And God doesn't need you to win the lottery to provide you with money. No, God solves your problems in the righteous way, the right way. Now, when we think of the way that God solved our biggest problem, the problem of sin and death and the problem of losing our soul, um, I could think of a lot easier ways for God to have done it than the way he did it. Um, I would 
For instance, I would not have made Jesus become a man. He was in heaven, let him stay. I wouldn't have made him become a man. I would not have made him obey the Old Testament laws. Why? He's perfect. He doesn't have to go through all that. I would not have made him suffer the abuse that he had to suffer. I would not have made him go to the cross, the most excruciating kind of death known to man, to bear the sins of the whole world. I would have figured out another way to do it. But the scripture says in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. My way wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have been just. It wouldn't have been right. God chose exactly the right way to do it so that his justice could be satisfied and everything would be done right and proper and the way it should have been. And that's the way God will solve your problems. Don't think of God as this genie who's going to do evil things to get you out of darkness or trouble. God will do miraculous things, but they will be the right things. And then finally, God solves your problems completely. That we might receive the full rights of sons. So we have this horrible problem of sin and a death sentence that puts us in danger of losing our soul for eternity. Now God could have kind of done a halfway solution for us. He could have done a little bit for us. He could have forgiven our sin so that we wouldn't have to go to hell. He could have forgiven our, our sins and allowed us to go to heaven. That would be pretty good, but God does better than that. God is more complete in solving your problems than that. It says that we might receive the full rights of sons. I'm going to skip by this and go to here. We become a part of of God's family, his children, with all the full rights of being God's child. God doesn't do anything halfway. He does it completely. And he will do that with your problems. Sometimes it's going to wait until you get to heaven. But many times it's going to be solved here in this world completely. Now, some people would say, well, if it wasn't done the way I wanted it to be done or in the time that I wanted it to be done, then um, it really wasn't complete. It really wasn't what it should have been. But remember, again, Proverbs, I'm sorry, I'm going to, um, I didn't put it back up there. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. God solves your problems completely, fully. He doesn't leave anything out. If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior because you realize that as a sinner you have a death sentence and are in danger of losing your soul forever, and you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, God solves that problem completely, 100%. And you are not just given forgiveness and heaven, but you are made his children with all the full rights of being a ch child. Jesus even calls us his brothers because we get some of those full rights that he has. He's God, yes, but as the God-man, we share in the full rights of sonship even with him. Oh, if you're here this morning, <laughs> my plea to you is this. If you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have never received God's solution to the problem of your sin and death and the losing of your soul. Oh, don't leave this place without having done that today. Talk with me. There's others of our staff that are around. There's people that um, are, are here each week that could help you. Please don't leave this place and lose your soul. You say, well, I'll have other opportunities. I don't know that you will. And you don't know that you will. And sometimes when God has planted a seed and put something in your heart, he wants it to bloom right then. He wants you to respond right then because there's no guarantee you'll have another opportunity. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for the fact that you care about us so much 
that you wanted to solve our problems, that you didn't just step off and sit down in a rocking chair somewhere and just watch it all happen. You got incredibly, intensely involved. And Lord, thank you first and foremost that you solved the biggest problem that we have, the problem of sin and death. Thank you for taking the right way, even though it was the hard way, to redeem us and to give us forgiveness and salvation. And then thank you also, Lord, that you solve all of our other problems in a similar way. In your time, according to your power, often in miraculous ways, in the right way, and completely. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that this service would not end before those who need Christ would receive him. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.